So here we are in 1 John, and today we're going to talk about the love that God hates. All right? The love that God hates. You know, in the sermon, uh, we're going to kind of notice that John gives his readers uh, assurance, and that's in verses 12 to 14. And then you get into verses 15 to 17, and he, he gives them a warning. You know, there was a group of, of children, first graders, actually, who went to tour a hospital. All right? And uh, the person who guided them on the tour, you know, opened it up for questions afterwards. And one little guy uh, asked them, he says, you know, why the people who work here, why are they always washing their hands? You know, because, you know, these, you notice that. And so everybody giggled, and when that all kind of subsided, uh, the tour guide uh, gave a really good answer. He says, well, they're always washing their hands uh, for two reasons. First, because they love health. And second, because they hate germs. Okay, I thought that's that's really a good analogy to go along with what we're talking about today, because really in more than one area of life you have this love and hate uh, that go hand in hand together. So we just want to talk about the love that God hates. And you know, actually, we could just say that, read that scripture, have a conversation together, and I think we'd all get it, right? I think we'd all get it. What God's trying to say to us there. But, you know, so far as we've been walking through 1 John, we've seen, uh, been reminded about the importance of love. Uh, we've seen about the right kind of love. And we've talked about the love for God and the love for others. And so John now is going to warn us that there is a wrong kind of love. And that's the love that God hates. And the Bible calls this the world. Okay? The love for the world is the love that God hates. And so let me point out that as Christians, we're in a battle. We know that, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are in a battle. And soon after we become a Christian, we discover that the Christian life uh, is not a playground, but it's a battlefield. And you know, and if we don't notice that, we're probably like so out of touch with our walk with Christ. That Satan said, well, no problems with that person. Just forget about them. But it doesn't mean everything has to be hard. But our life, as we choose to live for Jesus, we'll notice there's challenges because we are choosing to walk in godliness, to put Christ first. And there's always challenges that come, kind of distract us and disrupt us from that. You know, we're caught in the middle of a struggle. And that struggle is between good and evil. Here's God who through his spirit is trying to influence us for good. And then there's that other guy. <laughs> you know, there's Satan. And his cohorts, and what are they doing? They're trying to influence us for evil. You know, I mentioned to you guys at some point that we need to be careful about what evil we allow into our lives. I mean, that's what we allow evil into our lives sometimes. And I phrase it like this, how much ungodly influence is too much ungodly influence and the correct answer should be any okay because it's not good for us so we really have to be careful we have to think about that how much ungodly influence do we allow into our lives because any amount of ungodly influence is too much ungodly influence because it will distract us it'll divide our love and our loyalty from where it needs to be and uh you know, we sometimes have this tendency, if not now, you can identify at some point where you kind of want to straddle the fence. You know, you have one foot uh, is over here with God, and the other foot is in the world. You know, working with students most of my life, that's a constant struggle for them because Satan is trying to get their attention, to, to get them to say no to what they know is right as young people. And you get this straddling defense. How much ungodly can I still be considered being walking with Christ, you know? I don't have both feet on the ground walking with Christ. You know, a friend of mine, missionary Paul Gilly, I don't know if any of you guys know Paul, but Paul was the Word of Life missionary in Michigan for years. And uh, one day I had, come, I had Paul come speak at a retreat for our students. And uh, he... He, he gives us this, uh, this message on walking in uh, the right place. You got the place, the path, 
uh, the path, the pace, and the place. Okay, walking on the right path, walking at the right pace, and heading to the right place, something like that. And when he got all done, um, he, he mentioned that his wife, Cindy, is dying of cancer. Okay? He goes through this whole weekend, and at the very end, on Sunday, he shares the idea to the students that, listen, if I wasn't rock, walking on the right path, if I wasn't walking at the right pace, if I didn't have my focus on the right place, when this news came into our lives, I probably wouldn't be walking where I need to be walking today. Okay? And so when we take our feet off trying to straddle, you know, it, we're not going to end up being in the right path. We're not going to be walking in the right pace. And we're ultimately not probably heading in the right place, the right direction that God wants for us. It's so important to have no middle ground in our understanding. Either we love a love for God or we have a love for the world. And we're told that you cannot love both, right? You cannot love both. One or the other. Jesus taught, he taught us in uh, Matthew 6, he says, it's impossible to do what? Serve how many masters? Two masters. He says it's impossible to do that. And then James says in chapter 4, verse 4, he says, friendship with the world is hatred with God. How much of the world can we really be tight with? It's a very difficult thing. You should pray for those believers who seem to have a place of acceptance in, uh, in the world. Take, for instance, Tim Tebow. We all know Tim. You know, Tim still seems to have a place of connection. Think of Franklin Graham, you know, a place of connection and receiving him. But that's tough to be able to have a place and to not be distracted with the acceptance of the world. We need to pray for people like that. And we need to make sure that we're not in the situation where we should be to where we're having a love for the world that takes away from our love for God. You know, the famous preacher, Billy Sunday, uh, he used to make fun of the term worldly Christian. We've all heard that word, right? And I, 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 I've always heard that. You know, you think about what it means, like what well, it probably is not walking with Jesus as they should. Worldly Christian, but he's famous for having this. He says, you know, it's kind of like an oxymoron, what a worldly Christian. He says, he says, uh, if you talk about a worldly Christian, that makes about as much sense as talking about a heavenly devil. You know, that's really good. I wish I could have heard him say that himself, you know. But really, a worldly Christian, heavenly devil, that neither one makes sense, does it? Neither one. And if we look at our lives, or someone looks at us, and if they would think, oh, you know, they kind of like the world, but I know they're, no, we, we, we can't have that in our life. So John, he tries to address these kinds of issues today. And he's really doing two things we're going to see today. He wants to give encouragement, but he also wants to give exhortation. And so first, we're going to talk about that word of encouragement, then we'll talk about that exhortation that he has. And really the challenge that he's facing in this section is how do I, uh, you know, put a person on guard but make them not feel insecure in, in what they're doing. And in these verses in 12 to 14, he attempts to assure them that those who remained in the congregations, people were leaving. You know, there were, there were threats and there were charges, you know, and, and the false teachers were in there and people are leaving the congregation. And he wants to remind them that you people are in good standing with God. He wants them to know that they've been properly taught. And what they're taught is genuine for grounding their faith. And that they could have some charges made against them uh, by those who are left from the church, but their faith could be strong. Look what he says here. Because he wants to encourage them. He says in verses 12 to 14, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you dear children because you have known the Father. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. 
You know, as you look at these, these words of encouragement that he's giving to them, there's a symmetry that's going on here. He has these three groups. He has children, and he has fathers, and he has young people, and he addresses them twice. Okay? He goes through it twice there. And he when the second time he when he repeats, when he repeats, he's really just reinforcing the encouragement he wants to give them. Now there's some question uh, as to those titles. You know, you have the children, you have the fathers, and you you have the the young there. Are they literal literal age groups, right? You know, are, is that what they are? Are they children, fathers, young men? Or are they symbolic of stages of uh, spiritual maturity? Uh, or are they just simply just this literary uh, device that people are using that they're saying, well, it's just everybody that's going on there. Well, let me answer it for you. Because I know everything. <laughs> Maybe I don't, because you laughed. Oh. <laughs> No, I don't. Okay, but it seems that possibly uh, children stands for all the Christians that John is writing to, and it seems that fathers refer to the older believers, both men and women, and it seems that the young men refer to the young men and women in the faith community. You know, it was common in uh, early Christian times that. You, you address church members uh, with family terms. Okay? That was this kind of a common thing there. And John, he was, you know, he's common for referring to children as the whole faith community. So we'll see. But let's say this. So to the whole faith community, the dear children, he offers two reassurances. And I think he directs them course, you know, uh, to the controversies that perhaps they are they're facing. First he says. I'm going to assure you, reassure you that your sins have been forgiven. Right? That's important. Hey, that's so important that there are people today who think they could live in, they could have a certain sin and they could lose their salvation. So he's assuring them, no, your your sins have been forgiven. That's important. Not everybody believes that. And second, he wants to reassure them that they have known the Father. I mean, their faith is genuine. They really do know the Heavenly Father. Remember, now this is coming after what we've talked about the fellowship, right? You know, the fellowship with the Father, the fellowship with one another. And he's saying, you really know the Father. We've already walked through your fellowship with the Father. And so there are foundational truths that we're seeing here that Christians can cling to. It's important. And as children of God, we are uniquely qualified to cry out, Daddy, aren't we? You know, the, the Abba Father. We Our sins have been forgiven. We really know the Father. We know our sins are forgiven. So to the older community, you know, the older members, the more mature members, uh, he refers to them, the ones that he refers to as fathers, he wants to reassure them, like the whole community, that they have known the Father. But then he says uh, that it's been from the beginning that they have known the Father. Now obviously these guys haven't been alive since in the beginning God, right? But that, that's, that's not what he's talking about here. But that phrase in the beginning, that's kind of common to John in, in chapter 1, verse 1. He, he, he had reference about in the beginning about Jesus. And then in this chapter, in, in verse 2, he had in the beginning this reference to the command to love. So John's suggesting that those who are mature in their faith, those who have spiritual maturity, those who have this experience that it reaches back many years. He says, from the beginning, your, your experience has been around. You guys, you've been faithful for many years. You, you have a knowledge of God that is anchored from your years of experience. So he's pointing that out to them, they, that they're important, that they're, they're, they're seasoned with this wisdom uh, that gives them a steadfast faith. And that should be the case for us who are older, right? that we've known Christ a long time from the beginning here. We've known Christ a long time. It should be evidenced in the stability in our faith that we should be strong. We should be able to endure. We're not tossed back and forth, you know, like a ship on this. No, we have stability, and he's commending them for that. And then he uh, addresses 
uh, the young, you know, the, the young men, the young men and women in the community. And what do you say about them? He says that they've got this zeal, you know, and that's often not found in the mature. Okay, that's like, let's go, you know, let's do it, right? It's kind of like, let's teach kids. Come on, get on the floor and have fun with them. No, no, just me. <laughs> but they, they have a zeal. It's like, yeah, and we need that. We need to see that zeal. We need that, that energy constantly imputed into our lives from young people. So that's really important. And he affirms them by saying they are strong and that the Word of God abides in them. And the purpose for strong is so that they can overcome the evil one. Because there are so many challenges in youth to over, that the enemy is after after us, you know. Uh, the Psalms talks about that, you know, how the young man, you know, you know, my word have I hid in my heart, right? So I won't sin against you, Satan the tax them when they're young. We want kids ministry because not that we're trying to brainwash kids, not at all. The world might say that. We're not trying to indoctrinate kids, not at all. The world might say that. We just want kids to hear the truth when they're young so they don't have all the world clouding their minds first. And so Jesus, we want Jesus to be in their minds right from the beginning. So they bring in this zeal. We want young people to have victory over sin. And while John's overall point as he goes through here is to give assurance to the church, he's also about to give, ready to give them a strong warning. He's commending them. He's saying, you're doing it, keep doing it. And he wants to give them a, a strong warning. So guided by the Spirit of God. And we've got to remember that. When we read the Word of God, it is guided by the Word, Spirit of God, right? The Spirit of God guided men as they wrote the words that are there. So guided by the Spirit of God, he uh, pauses for a moment and he offers some, some encouragement, which is what we just saw. And by the way, we need encouragement. We need to read this and have that that encouragement also. We need assurance in our walk of with Christ, just like they needed assurance. We need to be reminded that our sins are forgiven on account of whose name? Jesus' name. It just says His name. It's Jesus' name. And we need to be reminded that we've known Him from the beginning. In other words, keep doing it. Come on, you've known Him. Stay faithful. You've been faithful. You're strong. The Word of God is in you. Be faithful to it. Because you need to encourage young people. And we know we're strong because the Word of God lives in us. The Word of God enables us to overcome the evil one. And we ought to be able to see that in our lives. Those of us who have walked with Christ for years, we ought to be able to see that. We ought to be able to testify to that. We ought to be able to encourage the lost that there's victory available to them. We ought to be able to encourage the young who are full of zeal that, yeah, you can continue on. God will prove himself faithful. It's important for us to be secure in these things. But that security shouldn't lead us to overconfidence or apathy. Uh, Richard says this, John's letter was intended to convict or to create, wasn't intended to convict or create anxiety. It was intended to encourage. It was written to those who knew they were true believers, who showed the mark of Jesus in their lives. How good it is when others let us know they have confidence in us. It can mean a lot to your family and friends if you give them that same kind of praise. So encourage one another. Encourage one another in their walk with Christ. And then he, he uh, gives, gives us uh, this word of encouragement, but then he gives us exhortation. So now he gives us, I guess you got to call it a stern warning. It can't, there's not much more in Scripture that is more stern than this. When he says in verse 17... Do not, right? That's pretty firm. Do not love the world or anything that's in the world. I mean, do not. It's like it takes you right back. Thou shalt not. <laughs> and here's John. Do not. But I think it's more like, please don't. <laughs> You're right? A pleading as much as an urging. Don't do it. Don't do it. It only leads to destruction. It only leads to regrets in your life. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Someone said the world here is the total system 
of values and perceptions that together are expressed in the culture of sinful human beings. Look what it says. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and his desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Two choices. Two choices stand before everyone, even God's children. Either we love the Father or we love the world. It doesn't change just because we come to know Christ. It's a battle. Am I going to let my affections go to the world or am I going to grow my affections for the Lord? We cannot claim to love God when our hearts are possessed by the world. Now maybe you can't, but I can certainly look into my life and see where I had a greater desire for what the world has offered at times than what God wants me to be focused on. And that led me in directions that I should not have gone. And I wish I had not gone. And it only brings regrets. And it only, it only limits our ability to serve the Lord. I, you know, for me, without going into long detail, but I remember after I was trained for ministry, I wasted 12 years before I went into ministry. Because I allowed my affections to be distracted with the world. What the world was going to give. And God was really smart in not letting me go into ministry. Because, man, I'd have messed up somebody. <laughs> or I'd have messed up some church, or many churches. And God had to get my head right, get the world out of my thoughts, so that I could focus and serve Him. Two choices. Love the Father, love the world. We cannot claim to love God when our hearts are possessed by the world. People say Christians can't be possessed. I agree. But we can be possessed by our heart's affection where it shouldn't be by the world. By the way, what does it really mean to love the world? Okay, What does that mean? I mean, why can't we love the world, someone might say. I mean, John 3.16 says that God loves the world, right? So why can't we love the world? Well, we know, right? We know there's more than one meaning for the word world. You know, there's the physical world. That's the earth, right? There's the world of mankind. Humans. God so loved people. God so loved the world. There's a world system. That's the way of life that is opposed to God. And I think that last meaning there is the one that John's referring to. John's telling us we have to avoid any infatuation with worldliness. Boy, when you think of infatuation, you think about something that's consuming a lot of your thoughts, don't you? We can't let that happen. We can't be there. Richard says, human societies are anchored deeply in the selfish cravings of sinful man. In man's tendency to greedily desire the materialistic things he sees. And in man's drive for ostentious self-importance. Each of these is antagonistic to God and a culture that weaves society from these values is corrupt. We as Christians have to abandon the values of human society and adopt the values of God the Father. Man's culture is not ours, and we should not be comfortable in it. You know, if you want a good read by somebody along these thoughts, read David Platt's writings. You guys familiar with David Platt? Read David Platt's writings. You know, read radical. You know, talk about losing your thoughts for the affections of the world. Great read for you. John lists three characteristics of this infatuation. Most translations, or at least the early translations, call those the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, the pride of life. You know, my favorite, now don't get mad at me or anything here, my favorite translation of Scripture is the New Century Bible. So I'm not ashamed to say it. The New Century. It's my favorite translation. When I read it, it just feels like I'm just having a conversation with God. You know, it's just, I love how it's written. Uh, this is my uh, devotional, uh, my time with God. Uh, it, it's not in print anymore, and it's in the New Century. That's how I was introduced to that. 
the new century. I just love uh, how the new century is written, and I just grab it. And if I ever read it and I think, oh, what, really? And I just flip to another translation and read the same thing, and I go, that is what it says. You know? <laughs> but it just helps me just have this conversation with God. I like how the new century takes these verses here. It says, these are the ways of the world. Wanting to please our sinful selves. Wanting the sinful things we see. Being too proud of what we have. And none of these come from the Father. But all of them come from the world. You know, we could spend a lot of time talking about these three characteristics. I don't really think that's necessary. I think every one of us understand in our heart of hearts what it means to love the world. We know what that really looks like, don't we? So our challenge is that our heart is deceitful. Boy, when I have got away from where my thoughts should be, my heart is deceitful at that point. You know, I can rationalize. It's easy for us to rationalize whatever we might be involved in that we shouldn't be involved in. So we've got to be careful how we might define the terms. But look at these three again, where he says, Wanting to please our sinful selves. You know, the desires of the flesh. That's what draws us, uh, which is sensuous, sexual, self-indulgent. You know, James says in uh, James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, right in there, you know, he's talking about God doesn't tempt anyone with evil, but everyone is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lusts. Drawn away and enticed. By his own lusts. Then it gives a bad story that it, it doesn't end well. But you're drawn away enticed by your own lust. He says, when you think of the flesh, remember that the flesh is opposed to the spirit. Okay? Your flesh is opposed to the spirit. That's why we're told, walk in the spirit, and you won't what? Fulfill the desires of the flesh. It's opposed to the fruit of the Spirit. And I, that includes self-discipline. That includes purity. The flesh, we don't want to be anywhere close to that. He says, wanting the sinful things we see. That's of the desires of the eyes. You know, that our eyes and our ears, they let things in that can cause us to become, begin to have an affection for things that God doesn't want us to have and affection for. And the desires of the eyes includes our attraction to the tangible and the material stuff that's in this world. Materialism is the enemy of contentment and spirituality. You know, the old saying, keeping up with the Joneses. Any of you guys old enough to hear? Remember that one, right? You know? Oh, good. I didn't know. Uh, keeping up with the Joneses. Now, even the world understood materialism. But they would say that. we got to keep, yeah. No, materialism is a dangerous thing. It's the enemy of contentment. I need a bigger house. I need a newer car. You know, this one I've driven it, nothing wrong with it, but I've driven it 200,000 miles. It's time for a new one. You know, whatever, whatever it might be. Contentment, materialism is the enemy of contentment and spirituality. And then being too proud of what we have. The, uh, the pride and boasting in what one has and does. I don't think we need to explain that too much. The pride and boasting in that. The arrogance of money and achievements and awards. Nothing wrong with having money. Nothing wrong with having great achievements. Nothing wrong with receiving re re rewards you know, and awards. Nothing wrong with that. But what does it do to our heart? That was what we got to be careful of. Give God glory. You know, it combines to a road. You know, if we're not handling our right, our, our sense of utter dependence upon God. Utter dependence. Appreciate the money. Thank you, God, for that. You know, thank you, God, for providing that for me. I appreciate, appreciate God that you enabled me to accomplish something over here. Give God the glory. I appreciate God that I've been acknowledged with success and an award to God be the glory. See, it's okay to have that in our life, but divert the glory 
to where it belongs, right? You can always give that glory to the Lord. Uh, John's opponents, they probably were ruled by this unholy trinity of worldliness. It's probably what was going on. And John wants his children to be on guard, to be on guard for the spiritual battle. And so John's quick to remind them and us, as it says in verse 17, that the world and its desires pass away. They don't last. But the person who does the will of God will live forever. Let me ask you a question here. What values do we find most important to us? You now that's just something to chew on, isn't it? What values do we define uh, most important to us? Do our activities, the things we do, the things we value, do they, do they mirror the values of the world? Or do they mirror the values of God? You know? What is it that is really important to me? Does it look more like the world? Does it look more like God? The world can fill our hearts. The world can fill a believer's heart with things that keep us from God. Keep us from living for Jesus. You know, the more adoration that uh, for the world that well, we have more admiration for the world than the world wins. Okay? Do we have more adoration for God than God wins? But the more adoration we have for the world, the less adoration we have for God it begins to dwindle. Got to really think about those things. At the point when our connection to our possession is strong, uh, well, it's difficult to accept that one day that possession is going to die. You know, I gotta have this, but yet that's gonna die. Might be just as hard for some people to accept the fact that the one who does the will of God will live forever. Really, God's gonna, yeah, yeah. The world stuff's not gonna last, but the things of the Lord will last forever. You know, I uh, for years I realized I could never get students to understand mortality. Could any of you, when you were a teenager, understand your mortality? No, no, I, I couldn't either. It took me until just a couple years ago, I think, to understand that. But, you know, but I want them to think about their eternity, okay? Because there is an eternity. Can't think about our mortality so much. You know, even now, I think, and I think about this once in a while, I think about this in this transition of life for me, moving out of student ministry and uh, moving into what I do now with, with you guys and such. I think, you know, what if God gives me another 25 years? You know, and, but that's all I probably have. You know, maybe it'll be thirty, but that's probably all I would have. You know, maybe it, as I was ch chatting this morning, maybe my plane's going to crash because. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bill. You know, just... <laughs> I won't go into everything, but it was kind of funny. I may only have today. Too bad for Becky that she's riding with me, but you know. <laughs> But preventing that from happening, you know, what do I have? I need to think about my eternity, even if I can't think about my mortality, right? I need to think about my eternity and what I do for Christ. That that is what is going to last. I like what Peter tells us in Second Peter. He says, "His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him." who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Yeah, we, we have the strength. God has given us the strength. We've got to trust that God has enabled us and will enable us, that God has equipped us and will equip us to escape the corruption that's around us that's caused by evil desires. And to do that, we need to be vigilant. We need to make every effort to keep our hearts fixed on loving God and not be drawn to the world. You know, the best way to do that is to eat healthy. Right? God will make sure I'm not weak so I can serve you. Well, then eat healthy, Charlie. Eat healthy. And where, where, where is the meat that we eat from? Where is the nourishment we get from? It's from His Word, isn't it? It's from 
reading and feasting and letting his words saturate us, soak into us, so we have the energy. And if we are on a fasting uh, diet, it's not a good thing for the spiritual life. It's not a good thing for that. Now we got to be vigilant, make every effort, and that's the first place you make the effort <clears throat> to keep our hearts fixed on loving God. Make the effort by removing the influence of the world that we know we shouldn't have influencing in our life. Be vigilant about those things. As we conclude, let me give you three keys to remember. The first is that we must be in the world, but not of the world. Okay? It's okay to be in the world. Thank God I'm in the world. I can be salt and light. I can influence the world. We want to be in the world, but don't be of the world. One man said it's right for the church to be in the world, but it's wrong for the world to be in the church. A boat in the water is good. That's what a boat's for. However, water inside the boat causes it to sink. Okay. Another example that might be if we picture ourselves uh, like a scuba diver in the water. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not, well, I guess you could even have the old tank one. Remember that? The guy go down on a thing and have a big tank over his head. You know, today they wear tanks and so forth. But still, a scuba diver, the scuba diver puts on this protective suit, right? Puts on this protective suit and he takes him into a special environment that he can go into. He's got this special environment with him so he can go into a hazardous setting and be protected because of the special environment. He doesn't breathe the water, right? But he breathes fresh air from somewhere else. So he goes into that special environment ready and protected. And so about us, we need to be uh, wearing a protective armor also. Okay? We need to be doing that. And we need to take our special environment with us as we walk in fellowship with God in the world. So put on the armor, put on the protective, uh, uh, protective gear, breathe the air that you should breathe as you walk in a dangerous environment. So let's check regularly ourselves and let's check collectively ourselves to see to what extent worldliness kind of has invaded us and invaded our values personally and if in worldliness has invaded into the church. Satan is crafty, so we got to be vigilant. And second, let's remember to value the whole family of God. Let's do that. We don't have a lot of young people, right? Lord willing, we will. But we need to value the whole family of God. John was offering encouragement in those verses in 12 to 14, and he said something specifically to the older, and he said something to the younger believers. And sometimes in churches, those two groups have a hard time understanding and appreciating one another. But in reality, both groups need each other, don't they? We need each other. Age doesn't necessarily prove that someone uh, has spiritual maturity or authority. Age doesn't necessarily prove that. And uh, those who are older, though, should have more mature faith. And they ought to be able to provide uh, you know, the, uh, the service to the body of Christ from being anchored in their faith from the beginning, as he said. And the church needs the stability and the wisdom that comes from the older. You know, I've learned, even before I became what some people would might think are older last week, was it last week in Kids Club? Uh, this girl said, can I guess how old you are? <laughs> Do I look old? No. And I, okay, go for it. 98. <laughs> I don't know if you heard it, Don. I go, Don, come stand up here by me. He didn't come, so I... Okay. 98. Another girl says, no, 95. <laughs> what is going on here with these kids? No. Yeah. But the world needs that. But... So along the way, I learned to appreciate the, the wisdom and the strength of the elderly. And as I get older now, not 98 yet, okay? You know, I hope to be able to do that same thing for the younger, okay? To, to show that, that the wisdom and the stability of, of knowing the Lord 
and how that can help them. But the younger men and women, they have something uh, very different to also to offer the faith community. There's this freshness, there's this passion, there's this transparency uh, that forms really a different kind of strength for the church. When you find a young believer who's very transparent and boy, I am really struggling to live for Jesus. It really does something to make you think about your walk with Christ. You know, that transparency really, really helps you. So let's be sure to value everyone in the fellowship for the contributions they make. And finally, uh, we need to remember that our security is not in our perfection, but it's in the grace of God. Uh, God's grace, of course, is no excuse to walk in worldliness, but it's our ongoing source of assurance. And John reminds his children that they're forgiven. Okay, assurance. You're forgiven on account of Jesus' name, what Jesus did for you. You know, that, that assurance that God loves you. You know, there's a story I read about a guy, it's in his article called Cliffhanger, and Kevin Young tells a story about a father, and he sums, it's, he thinks it sums up our security in Christ. I think it does a pretty good job. He says he was at a Special Olympics competition, and as the runners were being helped to their mark, you know, for the 400 meter race, a man in front of him, uh, all dressed up, three-piece suit, he jumps up and he starts yelling, you Lenny, go Lenny, you know, whoa, yeah, go. And so here's this overweight, middle-aged man with Down syndrome. And he turned his head and looked up at the man calling his name. And then the gun went off and the runners leaped forward. And everyone starts running except for Lenny. Dead last place. In fact, losing ground. He had this preoccupation with his hands. Okay? And he's just looking at his hands. And uh, so... Everybody's moving and he's moving slower. And pointing to him, the guy in front of him says, Hey, that's my son. Isn't he doing great? Okay. He's the guy that's not even hardly moving. You know, that's my son. Isn't he doing great? And when Lenny reached the last turn in the race and all the other ones had already finished, the man in the suit jumped up, began to shout encouragement to his son, waving his arms all in the air. Great job, Lenny! Way to go! You're doing great! You're doing great! And he said he turned around to us, the other spectators, uh, and, uh, and, and, he, uh, and he is saying, that's my son, he's about to finish. And so all he gets, all the people are applauding and feeling somewhat embarrassed probably, you know, cheering him on. And when he crossed the finish line, the man made his way down to the track and he embraced and hugged his handicapped son who is exhausted, but still wringing his hands. Okay? Still wringing his hands. Young says, when I watched them embrace, I began to weep. And I thought about what I saw. As I saw it, it, it seemed to me as though God was saying to me, you're like Lenny in this race. You're like Lenny. You're challenged. You're perplexed. You're behind the pack. In fact, most days you're just a pitiful pile of exhaustion out there. But I'm here cheering you on. I'm here cheering you on. <clears throat> and I love the way that man, and the way that that man loves his son. You know, my brothers and sisters, our security, that's what the world cannot give. You know, the world wasn't going to cheer that kid on. Not at all. But his father did. And you get your security from the Father. You get your encouragement from the Father. And that's why we've got to be on guard against the evils, desires of materialism and pride that tear us away from God. Keep our focus on the Lord. And that's why we will live forever because our sins have been forgiven on account of His name. You know, what do you and I need today? What do you need today? Do you need some assurance? Do you need some encouragement? Well, that you find that in those verses there. Do you need some exhortation? Do you need a warning? Do you a warning call maybe to wake up? You find that there too. So in this text, John's telling us to watch out. He says, love in the world will kill you, but loving God will bring life for you both now and in eternity. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of His name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have 
overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the Word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Words of encouragement. Keep doing it. And he says, if anyone loves the and he says, uh, do not love the world or what's in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of Father is in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lusts of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God will live forever. You know, if John had just had not put in verses 12 to 14, and he had jumped right in there with do not, Maybe it wouldn't have been as received as well, right? But God in His wisdom says, encourage the brethren. Encourage them. Let them know they're doing well. But let them know they need to keep doing well. Don't let the world distract them. Do not love the world. In a moment, we're going to have communion. We're going to remember God's great love for us, the sacrifice of Christ, what He did for us. Don't let it be wasted, so to speak, right? Don't be wasted. Love, don't love the world. Be someone that can share the love of Christ with others in your life. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's the truth. Thank you that it, you gave it to guide our lives. God, I pray that would be the case. Pray, Lord, that we would keep our affection strong upon you. Protect us from the affections of the world. Protect us through the truth of your word that guides us so that we can say no to ungodliness that the world throws in front of us. Give us victory as we trust in you. I know you do. I know you will. Convict us where we need to change. In Jesus' name, amen. you love us and we know that because you proved it when you sent Jesus and thank you for that thank you for uh, this act of communion this time to remember your great love for us through Christ 
God, I pray that as we take communion and we eat this bread, Lord, that it will not just be a reminder for us, Lord, but it, let it be a recharging. Let it be a revival in our understanding of your great love for us and our commitment to live for Christ. Thank you that Jesus was willing to give his life for us on the cross. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's eat the bread. Bible says what about the blood? That without the it says the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. Christ shed his blood for us. His life blood was shed for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Seems kind of sterile in this moment, doesn't it? To think about what Christ did for us on the cross, what he did in his body, and what he did on the cross, and the shedding of his blood. It seems kind of sterile because it was pretty horrific, wasn't it? But he was willing to endure spiritually. But we know that it's nothing compared to what he endured spiritually. When the Father turned his back on him, for the first time in all of ever. The Father and the Son had separation in that moment. Because Christ could not look on sin. And Christ took the sin that was ours upon Himself because He loved us. And the Father had to turn away from that. What, isn't it great that because of our faith, faith in Christ, we don't have to ever experience that rejection in that moment. Never. And when this life ends and we move on to the next life, we move into the presence of God to be with Him forever. Accept it because of what Christ did for us. Thank you, God, that Christ is willing to shed His blood and endure the suffering that we should have endured. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink it.